Hello everyone, I'm Inverse, and on today's episode of Strat Talk, we are going to be taking a look at another one of Malium's Wehrmacht build orders. Uh, this time we have a Samoa build order, a build order that our good friend Malium used in a 1v1 tournament a decent amount of time ago. This replay I'm about to show you is a year old. Uh, the next replay I will be showing you is of similar age, however I definitely feel this strategy holds up over time. It's a very powerful strategy. It's very similar in its in its style and execution to the previous Malium uh, Strat Talk episode I did, episode number three I believe. I encourage you to check that one out, the uh, Angleville cutoff strategy, uh, before you check out this one since a lot of, a lot of kind of I don't know, I'm trying to find the right word to say. I guess a lot of theory and a lot of technical aspects transfer over from one uh, from one strategy to the other. There's a lot of similar ideas at work between the two. Uh, but with that in mind, let's kind of take a look at this build order, capping order, stuff like that. The general build order is Volks, Volks, Sniper, MG, MG. And... You go defensive with this, you get a medic bunker, depending on how aggressive your opponent is, it can be back here, it can be here, it can even be as far up as here, and we'll kind of get on and talk about the different situations and when you would want to put it back here, when you want it here, when you want it a little bit more aggressive. Um, your first building pioneer is going to build your Wehrmacht quarters. And then it's going to instantly shift Q to cap this VP. And then from that VP, go down and cap this munitions point. Meanwhile, your built pioneer is going to come up here and cap this plus 10 fuel. And then head back down here and cap this plus 10 munitions before heading into the middle to start capping these points. This is unique to many standard build orders because in a lot of situations, you're going to be focusing on this left-hand side munitions and fuel point. This strategy says let's not worry about this left hand side at all. Let's lock down this right hand side. Let's establish a solid base in the middle and push out from there. That consolidates your forces, makes it a lot more difficult to flank and makes it a lot easier to defend flanks because this is a map that's traditionally been fairly difficult to defend flanks on, at least relative to a lot of other maps, because there's a lot of areas that you have to cover, there's a lot of green cover in the middle, there's also a lot of buildings that can be used both as shot blocking and as a source of garrisonable cover. So it can be fairly difficult to hold off flanks uh, on this map as Wehrmacht, and this strategy does a pretty good job of alleviating those difficulties. Now as we saw, that first Volk squad went right here to cap this uh, strap point, headed down here to cap this strap point to connect this munitions point. Second Volk squad came down and met up with the first Volk squad, and they both came into the center together. That's a very important point of this strategy. Uh, it's very important to keep these two initial Volks together. I actually didn't mention, but our opponent is Aljaz5 Fireball, who is... Uh, level 20 with three of the factions currently, and level 19 with one, which is very impressive. Big ups to you, Aljaz. Uh, but yes, it's very important for you to keep these two Volk squads together when you head into the middle, because you are banking on catching one of your opponent's rifle squads without support, which was the case in this situation. This one four-man rifle squad was sitting in that green cover taking a lot of damage from these Volk squads before the reinforcing rifle squad showed up. That gives Malium a huge advantage in this upcoming engagement. He can focus down on this four-man squad, deal a lot of damage to him. He has a pioneer he can use in support, or he can use to cap around, anything like that. He also has a sniper on the field right now that's going to give him the advantage and allow him to push back. Uh, push back this little assault and if as you probably noticed in the meantime our American player Al Jazz did decap this uh, this fuel point up here and is now coming in for a flank very nice mine placement right here Malium is a big fan of this mine we'll see it in the next game as well 
and in a lot of the games in the replay pack that I took this replay from, from this is an area that mining that is mined a lot in Malium games, and I really like the idea behind mining this area because what it does is it limits your opponent's options and it focuses your attention to defending fewer areas at one time because that's one of the chief problems with Samoa when it comes to defending flanks is the fact that if we look at just the architecture of the map right now there are so many individual flanking lanes that you have to cover as a Wehrmacht player if you can remove one of those from having to worry about it it's always going to put you in a better spot You've got right here that you got to worry about, this area, coming down from here, coming through here, coming up to here, this green cover, coming down this area, coming all the way around here. There's so many different areas that your opponent can flank from. It makes it very difficult if you don't zone him out with mines, with wire, stuff like that. Mines, one of the best ways to do it, just because they deal manpower damage while at the same time suppressing and giving you an awareness of where your opponent is which is a very key uh, aspect of mines is the audio and visual feedback you get when a mine goes off you know oh hey there's units over here even if I don't have vision of those units I know there's units in this area and I can react accordingly uh, speaking of, mun of munitions and mines this is a defensive strategy so with that in mind, we are going to want to use and utilize uh, For the Fatherland if we need it. For the Fatherland is kind of a last resort defense against flanking with this strategy. It's not a mainstay of the strategy. It's not what you want to be using all of your mun uh, munitions on, especially in the early game. Your goal should be to keep your mun munitions around 45, so if you do need to pop a For the Fatherland to defend a crucial flank, you can. But if you don't, you can spend the rest on mines, because mines are extremely crucial for this strategy. Mines extremely powerful on Samoa, because there's a lot of choke points, there's a lot of roads, there's a lot of heavily traveled areas, and that makes mines very powerful and very useful. Furthermore, this is a very heavy tier 1 strategy. If you noticed, we have 5 tier 1 units, one of them being a sniper. That's very manpower intensive in terms of our tier 1 expenditures. And that's going to make any sort of fast M8 all the more powerful because it's going to delay our tier 2 tech, it's going to delay our pack, and in turn delay our grenadier. If we notice, it's already 7.30 into the game and we're just now getting our Krieg Barracks up. That's going to delay our pack to almost the 10 minute mark. That's very late when you consider a normal fast M8 timing hits around the 8 minute mark. Sometimes earlier depending on how hardcore your opponent's going for that rush. Now another thing I really like about Malium's kind of decision making with this strategy and just when playing Wehrmacht in general is he constantly has an attack, attack, attack mentality going into the mid game. And what I mean by that is this little push up right here. Now chances are our American opponent is going to have an M8 soon, but if our American opponent is playing passively and is trying for something like snipers and a Sherman, this is going to be very powerful and this is going to do a few things. First of all, it's going to force a reaction out of your opponent, which is always a good thing to do when you have defensive because you can use for the fatherland and you can use fortify the perimeter with a bunker, which we will have going up soon in order to tip the scales into your favor when it comes to uh, defending those flanks. M8 is out right now, but another thing that pushing forward and being aggressive with this strap point does is it allows you to buy it buys yourself a bit more time to recap this fuel point you don't have to recap it as soon because you've cut your opponent off from gaining those resources this is a tier 2 to tier 4 strategy with defensive there's no veterancy involved until the super late game and usually the veterancy is spent on tanks there's no super early tech in the early game as long as you have the, the fuel to get to tier 2 which is why we cap the fuel point right away instead of capping this munitions point and then capping this fuel. We want this fuel right away because we want to be able to get to tier 2 when we want to. After that, 
it's it's perfectly fine to have your fuel harassed provided you can limit the amount of that fuel that your opponent actually sees you don't want your opponent gaining a lot of fuel income an unreasonable amount of fuel income from two plus ten fuel points if you can avoid it now the m8 is going to go down right here this is very good use of mines and this is what i was talking about before how incredibly powerful and useful mines can be on a map like Samoa, especially when defending against the fast M8. And now if we look at Malium's situation, we have a pack out on the field right now. We have a Grenadier squad it's starting up right now. Malium tends to go for three Grenadiers with this, uh, with this strategy. The bike, which I didn't mention earlier, is not a necessary uh, factor, necessary component to this strategy. It is, from what I've been able to ascertain based on watching games, a response to, uh, to uncertainty when it comes to what the American player is doing. It's a nice little defense against snipers and the possibility of sniper play and it gives you some scouting information and bikes are just generally speaking very useful uh, at in all parts of the game they're far more useful than jeeps in my opinion uh, simply because of the dynamic of the Wehrmacht faction and how bikes are used as opposed to how jeeps would be used and stuff like that uh, but as we notice Malium still hasn't really been able to, to secure this fuel point, and that's perfectly fine. We're at the 11 minute mark right now. We're going to see tier 4 tech, generally speaking, around the 15 to 18 minute mark. That's when we generally see, uh, we see tech out of Malium with this strategy. And that gives him a solid base of three grenadiers, a mortar sometimes. Actually, a lot of the time we see mortars, and a pack. And allows him to deal a lot of manpower damage. As, as we see right here, for the Fatherland being popped, very good situation to pop for the Fatherland. Going to focus down a engineer right there. And main main key of this strategy is keeping hold of the center because this allows you to very easily jump up here, apply pressure to the strap point, which forces your your opponent to narrow his focus. You want your opponent to be defending this strat point because that means he's not attacking nearly as much on this right hand side and that's the main difficulty with this map is being able to split your attention and splitting your attention adequately and intelligently between defending this right hand side and attacking up here. Now this mine made me smile. How many times do you see a mine planted right there? How many times? Not very often. It's just another one of those little, little nice things I like about Malium's play. I really, really like Malium's Vermont play. It's very intelligent, and I, I hope I'm doing a good job of, or at least an adequate job, a decent job of communicating why I enjoy watching Malium's Vermont play so much. Because a lot of it is, it's kind of. I, I see something and I go, oh, that, that that does make a lot of sense. And it's kind of hard to articulate, so I apologize if I seem like I'm kind of repeating myself. Because it's very, very specific small things that make a lot of sense when you think about it, but don't necessarily come to mind immediately when you're thinking about how to play Vermont. Uh, but anyways, we see Malium delaying his tier 4 tech a little bit and playing very defensively at this point. The main reason for that is Aljaz rebuilt his M8 and is still being ag aggressive with his M8. The nice thing about this strategy is it can passive it can it can passive it can punish passive American play in a way that a lot of other Samoa strategies simply cannot. Something like a standard tier 1, tier 2, tier 3 has a far more difficult time punishing passive American play than a strong tier 2 tier 4 defensive strategy which is what we see in this instance out of Malium and the main reason for that is with the tier 2 tier 4 strategy you have the tier uh, the tier 4 follow up if your opponent decides to sit back on a howitzer and get snipers and stuff like that it can become very difficult as a Wehrmacht player to play a standard kind of middle of the road normal I'm gonna get tier 3 then I'm gonna go 
and build some pumas, I'm gonna build some grenadiers, I'm gonna get some veterans. See, that kind of style can be very difficult to play on Samoa. And that's because the choke points, the buildings that are very good for mines as a Wehrmacht player are also very good for mines as an American player. And also limits drastically the effectiveness of anything like Pumas and stuff like that because there's so much shot blocking. And it's so difficult to be mobile because of all the chokes and all of the very effective mine positioning areas. So with that in mind, a tier 4 strategy, on the other hand, has a lot more versatility because you have a lot more survivability in your Ostwins. They're far more durable than Pumas, and they come ready-made to deal with M8s, which is something Pumas do not have the luxury of. And that helps you out a little bit in terms of mobility and map control because this can be a very difficult map to be mobile on with... Uh, with packs. Packs are very difficult to use intelligently and powerfully with this map layout just because of the same reasons as flanking is easy and MGs are difficult to use on this map. There's just so much shot blocking and there's so many little areas that the Wehrmacht player, or the American player rather, excuse me, uh, the American player can hide his M8, can duck behind this little hedge right here, can duck behind these buildings, there's a lot of areas that make it very difficult for a Wehrmacht player to counter an M8 using standard tier 2 play. And if you go for something like heavy Gren spam, you might be able to deal with the M8 in that situation, but you risk opening yourself up to something like heavy sniper play, snipers mixed with howitzer, anything like that, and those situations are far more difficult to deal with than simple standard M8 when you go tier 4. Now as we notice we do have a howitzer on the field for Aljez. We have a very strong position for Malium right now able to cut off the American player down here once again. Constant aggression coming out from Malium. Constant aggression all the time. Not getting veterancy either. Saving all of his fuel up for his eventual tank depot transition or not tank depot, uh, but rather tier 4 transition, and using for the fatherland intelligently when he sees large flanks coming, such as this right here. That's one of the most important uh, things to do, and things to know how to do with a strategy that involves defensive in any way, is knowing when to spend the munitions on for the fatherland, and when it's simply not worth it. A lot of times, against very good players, you are going to be short on munitions. You're going to be spending munitions on Fausts, on Panzer Shreks, on Mines. You're not going to be able to... You're not going to have the luxury of spamming for the Fatherland whenever you please. And with that in mind, it's very important to understand when you should be doing it, when you shouldn't be doing it. Obviously, you want to be doing it when your opponent is flanking with a lot of units coming at you when you are in a slightly vulnerable position or in a situation where you need a little extra firepower and a little extra survivability which in most cases are flank defense uh, that's the that's generally speaking the the most frequent use you're going to have for for the fatherland uh, in the mid game but I actually didn't mention this earlier but the breakdown of uh, command point distributions for this strategy is the first point goes into for the fatherland and that allows you to defend against any super early flanks if you get yourself in a really bad position or if your opponent is being super aggressive and catches you off guard you can defend against that and maintain your uh, central position it also allows you to get uh, fortify the perimeter second which is very important because it drastically adds to your ah you don't die no, you're not. Yes, you are. You're not. Are you, are you, are you, are you, are you, no you're not. Uh, but yeah, uh, for the five the perimeter, drastically adds to your staying power, which is very important on a map like Samoa because it can be very difficult once you've been pushed off the map to regain a solid foothold, especially in the middle because of all of the very good mine positions. It can be very easy for an American player to cap up the middle, disconnect you from your territory, lay down a bunch of mines, and you come out to reclaim your territory, hit a bunch of mines, force yourself to retreat, or be forced to retreat rather, and then your opponent is in a very is in a pretty good spot. He can be very aggressive 
on your cutoff once again because you're going to be forced into this little choke point and he's going to have the benefit of reinforcement and stuff like that uh, which is very helpful in such a situation uh, but if we look back at the base Malium is going to be teching a little bit more quickly now he put up a uh, an observation post, he has a decent amount of map control, he's been able to push off his American opponent from the top left area, which is a big moment for any Venomox player, because it allows you to be a lot more aggressive on this left hand side, and when you hit a critical mass of units, which, which at this point, if we look at the unit tab, we have three Grens, we have a pack, two MGs still, we still have the two Volks, we still have the Sniper, we still have the Mortar. That's a lot of units, and that can cover a lot of ground in this at this point in the game, where the American player has lost a few M8s, he's lost two M8s now, he's lost a lot of manpower from his rifles, he's built a Howitzer, which isn't a unit that gives him map presence, it can deal a lot of damage, but it's not another unit on the field that can split your opponent up or anything like that. So it's at a time like this when it's fairly safe for the Wehrmacht player to actually push out, but times earlier than this, we noticed Malium being very defensive in the middle, and that's simply because he had to be defensive. If he pushes out too far, he was being aggressive up here, he would commit a Volk squad and an MG squad to pushing up to forcing a reaction out of his opponent by going for the cutoff but never committing more than that because a committal of something more than that can be very dangerous at such an early point in the game where your opponent has access to a far larger far wider array of offensive text than you do uh, you as the as the the Wehrmacht player don't really have access to offensive tech, uh, tech with a strategy such as this. When you're not really worried about pushing to take back your f uh, fuel point, you have to be defensive because you have no other option. Now For the Fatherland does allow you some aggressive potential and we've seen Malium make great use of that when pushing on his opponent's strap point and stuff like that but generally speaking without fuel it's very difficult for Vermont to be very aggressive until they have veterancy or until they already have tech both of which obviously require fuel uh but now 22 minute mark very late in this game this is actually far later than we're going to see from uh from the tank depot tech or the not the tank depot i keep saying that from the from the tier four tech in the next game uh, we're going to see a slightly earlier timing, actually something like five minutes earlier. And the main reason for the later, delayed timing in this situation is the fact that Aljaz invested so much of his tech and so much of his early uh, income in those M8s. In the two M8s, he didn't really transition off of M8 tech too hardly. We noticed there hasn't been any sort of weapon support center tech at all. There was M8. There was bars, there was infantry, and now there's a howitzer. There wasn't really a sharp transition in the mid game. It was more gradual, uh, working off of the existing tech that Aljaz had. And in that situation, you don't really want to be aggressive with your teching because you need to be defending with what you have, and you need to be defending against your opponent's tech without risking. Uh, putting like getting yourself caught off guard by your opponent having just a lot more units than you while you're teching because that's a, a big problem that a lot of Wehrmacht players find themselves in is while you're teching your opponent hits you with bars in an M8 and they have three more units than you and you're just dead and that's something Malium is acutely aware of and works to kind of rectify and to defend against by extending his tier 2 phase against a hyper aggressive opponent and delaying his tech as a result and that has allowed him in this situation to retain a hefty slice of map control and allow him to get his tier 4 tech up when he's comfortable and when he is able to do so safely without really having to worry about 
his opponent flanking him when he's not ready and killing him or dealing significant damage and then him just not really being able to to push back and retaliate in any strong form which can be difficult in a lot of situations especially on this map because it's a very slippery slope kind of situation playing on some wise venom octic it's going really really well until it's not going really well and then it's going really terribly and the main goal of this strategy is to avoid that sharp transition and make it a little bit more gradual make it a little bit easier to cope and deal with and that's one of the reasons why this is one of my one of my favorite uh, Wehrmacht builds on Samoa. So that's going to be the end of game number one. El Jazz concedes and we are going to go on to game number two which is going to be the same map, the same starting positions and a different but familiar opponent. I'll see you guys on the other side. Alright guys, welcome back. We are on Samoa once again, and we're going to be taking a look now at game number two. We got Malium up here on the top, going up against the victim of our previous episode, Damn Evil Vicious Mouse. Dev M playing on the bottom as the Americans. Uh, so before we get into this replay, I just want to mention that someone posted in the comments of the previous replay asking if I was only doing Wehrmacht videos. Uh, that is definitely not the case. I am primarily going to be focusing on American and Wehrmacht videos with this series, and American videos obviously with my US vs PE case studies series. Uh, it's just that my last few videos, my last three, have focused on Wehrmacht strats because those have just been the strats that I've thought about and been really interested when I've decided, hey, I want to record an episode. So that's that's all there is to do with that. I will definitely be doing some American games in the near future. I'll be doing some more Wehrmacht games. Uh, so look out for those, too. There will definitely be variety. It won't just be Malium. It won't be the Malium talk hour, three days a week. As, as much as I'm sure he would enjoy that, I'm not sure if that would be if that would be good viewing material. But anyways, let's get on with this game right now. Same capping order coming out from Malian. We're going to see a fairly similar game out of him. And slightly different reactions out of Devon. We're going to see how our Wehrmacht hero decides to respond to... To what his American opponent is doing. I'm really trying hard to ignore this text because I've already watched this replay and there is a ridiculous amount of talking. So I will do my best to not be distracted, but if you notice me just randomly stop talking when text appears on the screen, I apologize. I will do my best to ignore it all. And damn you, Naliam and Devon, for being friendly with one another on this field of war. Uh, I don't know why I just lapsed into a terribly terrible English accent so to be smacked for that uh, but anyways <laughs> we have Malium coming down here again pushing forward just a little bit with this Volk squad to push off this engineer and that's gonna give his pioneer a little bit more freedom to cap this fuel point right here now going to back up a little bit with this Volk squad and meet up with this second Volk squad and as I mentioned in the last video, going to want to push forward with these two squads together as opposed to going with one before the other, anything like that. Now Devon being very aggressive in this situation, so now I'm going to hop in this building, bring up his second Volk squad to, to support, and this is the ideal situation for Malium with this strat, dealing a lot of damage to this in initial rifle squad which even if it's not forced to retreat makes it a lot easier to deal with subsequent engagements because the American player is going to have far weaker squads even though he may have the same amount or a greater number of squads. Uh, so that gives Malium a solid foothold on the middle and that is his objective with the early game of this strategy. We notice 
a rifle squad coming up here to harass this fuel point and that's going to allow uh, Malium to be very aggressive uh, both in the middle and on the bottom. We notice actually sending these Volks toward the middle to cap up a little bit of territory. Devim doing a pretty good job of harassing on this right hand side. This is a very important strap point to hold as the, the Wehrmacht because it connects this plus 16 to, to your base which is a very important uh, resource point on this map and with this strategy because defensive is a fairly, uh, a fairly munitions intensive strat especially when you take into consideration all of the mines that you want to be placing in order to defend against M8s and stuff like that. Now we have a little flank coming in from the Devon, but because of that very, uh, very strong early engagement from Malium, this isn't really going to do anything. A, gr a grenade coming out, but it's on Volks, so that's very easily dodged. And now Malium knows what he's going up against. He knows he's going up against early grenade tech, he knows his sniper is going to have free reign, he's going to be able to be aggressive and be aggressive with his tech. And what I mean by being aggressive with his tech is not teching to tier 3 or anything like that, but is delaying tech a little bit, getting out maybe a mortar a little earlier, getting out a Gren squad a little earlier with that tier 2 that isn't up yet, but that will be up very shortly. And gener in general, allowing him to allocate resources to things other than worrying about anti-tank because that's generally what you're worried about in the mid game on this map and on most maps uh, against the, uh, the, the, not the Wehrmacht, why am I saying the Wehrmacht? Against the Americans, you're generally speaking worried about the M8 tech and against someone who's gone fast grenades you can be worried and you should be slightly concerned about M8s, but it shouldn't be your primary concern, especially not in the minutes leading up to or the minutes directly after uh, after the grenades have been shown and your opponent has made an attack and you're still playing out a mid game and an early mid game, really not even a, a regular mid game. Uh, which in this situation we're at the six minute mark, which is still fairly early. Uh, but uh, Devim was able to push off our Wehrmacht player Malium and is going to go for the cutoff, which is definitely not a bad idea at all. Meanwhile, we have a lot of harassment going on down here on the bottom. We have this fuel point, which is neutralized, not capped yet, by our Wehrmacht player, which is perfectly fine. Ne neutral is what we want for this fuel point. Once we have enough fuel for the tier 2 building, uh, this fuel point is not important to the, the Wehrmacht player insofar as it does not have to be controlled by the Wehrmacht player. The one caveat is we don't want it controlled by the American player either because having 2 plus 10s on a map where the main fuel income is 2 plus 10s is a little uncomfortable if you're a Wehrmacht player. That's kind of asking to get run over by Shermans and howitzers and all sorts of stuff like that. Now, now as we notice right here, Malium's being extremely defensive and there's a few reasons for that. First of all, Devim showed grenade tech, which is an infantry aggression technology. It's very conducive to early attacks and it signals to the Wehrmacht player that the American player is going to want to be aggressive at least a little bit. And second of all, there were these two mines that we saw uh, revealed by this minesweeper. And that's a very good reason on a map like this to be defensive. Until you have a minesweeper, that can move out. And even if you can't sweep the mines early, at least detect them and figure out where they are so that you can avoid running over them with MGs, Volks, snipers, anything. Because that's one of the most difficult things to uh, to recover from in the mid game is a lot of mines placed by an American player after being pushed off by an early flank. That can kind of seal the deal and make it very difficult to push out at all. Now, if we look at the timing of this uh, Krieg Barracks, started just after the eight minute mark, that's about a minute later 
than it was started in the previous game, and that's because the early grenade tech gave Dev or not Dev Malium a little extra comfort and a little, a little extra security. Allowed him to reinforce a few more guys. He didn't really have to cut anything in order to get that Creek Barracks out because he's not really too worried about. Ooh, that was a little voice crack. <clears throat> One second. I am going to take a sip of water. Whew. Mm. There we go. My goodness. It's like I'm back in seventh grade. Uh, I completely lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah. Uh, Malium doesn't really have to worry too heavily about that M8. He, of course, does have to worry about it coming up fairly soon because 40 fuel when you've controlled this fuel point, this fuel point, and this fuel point. That's a fairly hefty amount of fuel, even without this other plus 10 up here. And if Devim does decide to go for an M8, it will hit the field relatively sh uh, relatively soon. So it's definitely going to be something that Malium's going to have to worry about in the near future, but not necessarily the immediate future. And as we see, a mortar coming out first, which is a very powerful, uh, a very powerful tier two unit that not a lot of people really use, uh, but that Malium uses, especially on this map, to great effect. And as we notice right now, uh, Malium has decided it is time to push out, and the main reason for this is we have Devon playing fairly passively. I mean, relatively speaking, we had early grenade tech, we had a few early flanks, and then we had that last flank, which is kinda, eh, kinda seemed like it was a, hey, I'm still out here, I'm still doing stuff, don't worry about me, don't really, don't care about what I'm doing back at home, because what he was doing back at home was getting that M8 out, and if we notice, the pack is going to be on the way. We have a, adequate bank of munitions so we are going to be able to delay this a decent amount and one thing that a lot of people don't take into consideration is the effectiveness of mortars as, is as uh, anti m8 not necessarily as a form of killing the m8 but as a form of damaging the engine of the m8 and forcing a repair boom just like that a direct shot from a mortar actually has a very good chance it actually might be a 100 percent chance though i'm not sure so don't quote me on that uh, but it is a very good chance of damaging the engine of the M8, which effectively puts it out of commission until the the engine is repaired. Because it's very risky, as an American player, to invest in an M8 and then to not to not really get any utility out of it because it got a damaged engine and then a pack just one shot it. So you're going to see Devon be very passive with that M8 right now because he simply cannot afford to lose in a situation like this. His grenade tech didn't really buy him the map control he wanted or needed. Generally speaking, an early infantry tech like that is going to aim to do one of two things, either deal damage or gain map control. And in Devon's situation, no damage was really dealt. The grenades were for the most part dodged and not much map control was achieved either. Malium's been able to hold this central area for almost the entirety of the early game. That's a very, uh, a very big advantage to him, uh, considering it's generally fairly difficult to hold both the middle and the right-hand side as as the Wehrmacht player on this map. And we are going to take a break in the analysis just to watch this because this was awesome. This, this made me laugh and smile. Devon has no idea this mine's here. Well, he does have an idea. He, he, he didn't see that being planted. What he saw was, hey, this pioneer is trying to bait me into something. Because why else would a pioneer run over this area instead of retreating from a rifle squad? Unless he was trying to, to bait bait him over the mine so that made me laugh and smile and I was like yay awesomeness uh, but anyways let's 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 not talk about how awesome Devin is anymore and talk about how awesome Malium is anymore because this is his episode or his second episode I guess yay Malium um, so at this point our Wehrmacht hero is in very good shape he is getting his third grin out. No, his second grin out. Only getting his second grin out. That's perfectly fine. We're at the 1330 mark, so we're going to see 
uh, tier 4 tech in the near future, but not in the tier near future. In four minutes or so, we're going to see tier 2 come out. And that's going to give him a decent amount of time to build up his infantry strength and to solidify his map control in the middle and on the right hand side because that's kind of his main focus at this point in the game is being able to hold this munitions point keep it connected with this uh, with this strap point harass the left hand side as much as possible because this is as we mentioned in the, in the last game reaching the critical point where the Wehrmacht player has enough resources and the, Amer and the American player has been forced into reinforcing and building up less relevant units and it gives the Wehrmacht player a decent little advantage when it comes to uh, the number and quality of units on the field and allows him to leverage that advantage to gain a little bit more map control and a little bit more security and by extending the tier 2 a little bit that was sloppy by Devin but, uh, but yeah by extending the tier 2 a little bit and delaying the Ostwin tech, we see the tier 3 just coming up right now, tier 4 will be coming up directly afterwards. By delaying those techs, we have a much stronger mid-game army than we would generally have in a tier 2, tier 4 uh, strategy. Generally, you stop, or the general wisdom is you'd stop after 2 grands a pack and maybe a mortar. And by adding this extra Gren, you're adding a lot more stability. And when you factor in the fact that you have a med bunker in the middle right here, you give yourself a lot more opportunity to outplay your opponent because you're constantly on the map and you're constantly being active as opposed to having to spend time retreating and reinforcing. You can just re uh, reinforce right on the field. You have For the Fatherland, which can help you out immensely. Uh, in actually retaining that map control that you so desperately need for a strategy such as this and if we look at the resources right now we have a nice healthy bank of everything and that's going to be going down pretty quickly once the once the the panzer command goes up once we have registered artillery all sorts of things like that are going to eat into the resource count of our Wehrmacht player. So we're just going to speed things up a little bit right now. A lot of this is just skirmishes. Lots of stuff dying. Let's skip ahead until we get to the Ostwins. We can talk about the Ostwins. Ostwins build. Build. We have tier 4. So we have the tier 4 building. If we, if we look at the timing of this uh, of this Panzer Command, 17 minute mark it went down. That's, what's that, 5.5 minutes earlier than in the previous game. And if we notice what Devim has shown, he's shown a single M8. He lost that single M8. He hasn't rebuilt that M8 at all. He hasn't made clear what his subsequent tech is going to be. Generally speaking, after an M8, you're going to see a an American player go into howitzers go into snipers or go into tank depot snipers and howitzers are best dealt with uh by by tier four bren or sherman's kind of a mix of tier two and tier four can be considered the best you have panthers that you can definitely go for as a safety measure against those uh higher tier uh american units you also have your base of tier 2 infantry and packs and stuff like that to help you out as well. So it's very, uh, it's a very robust, uh, robust, it's a very robust strategy to decide to go for the tier 4 after your tier 2 as opposed to the more popular, at least recently, tier 3 right after the tier 4. That can leave you open to a mix of artillery and Shermans. It can be very difficult for a uh, tier 3 style to actually counter that combination of units in the mid to late game, especially on a map like this, where it's so difficult to be mobile with your packs against fairly sturdy Shermans that take a lot more than a single pack and a few Gren hits to kill. You really need something like Panthers in such a situation in order to really limit the mobility and usefulness of any sort of tank depot units. It can be very difficult with 
uh, with straight tier 4. Or straight tier 2, rather. But, as we see, the decision has been made, and snipers is what our American player will be focusing on right now. And that's perfect for what our Wehrmacht player is doing. This, in my opinion, is the most difficult of the three styles to counteract. Even with a strategy like this, which is specifically designed and specifically engineered to defend against and counter this kind of transition, the purpose of Tier 4 is that it gives you an opportunity to be super aggressive against any sort of player who's decided to turtle to snipers, howitzers, and anything like that. And that's a very powerful... Uh, a very powerful ability to have being the ability to put pressure on an, your opponent who if you allow him to is going to be playing as passively as possible because he wants to get his howitzer up he wants to get snipers up he wants to counter your tier 2 tech as hard as he possibly can and the counter to that tier 2 tech is the shermans and is the howitzers and it can be very difficult uh, without preempting this uh, transition by going for tier 4 yourself to actually deal with something like that. That kind of combination of units is very strong in the late game for an American player to have. So we're going to skip forward a little bit right now because my voice is getting tired and I'm running out of things to say. Oh no. Um, what do we have building? Do we have anything building? We're probably going to have another Austin coming out soon. Uh, we have a very aggressive use of the Ostwind right now. And this is why Ostwinds are nice when compared to, uh, to Pumas, is that they deal far more manpower, far much more, far much more, my goodness, they deal far more manpower damage than Pumas, simply because they kill units a lot quicker than Pumas do. I noticed they actually killed two rifle squads right there. Still isn't dead because it's a tank in every sense of the word. Uh, and yeah. Our American player has pushed pushed off our Vermont player and got him down to a sniper, two Grens, and, and an Ostwind, which is pretty crazy. But let's fast forward and see what happens. What happens? What happens? What's being built? Something's being built. Anything. Pioneer! Build the Comcraft Center! Cancel the Comcraft Center! Oh my goodness! It's anarchy. What's going on? The sniper. As one kill, poor sniper. We now have a semblance of a normal army. Two MGs. Do we have that? Is that the same Ostman? No, that was a new Ostman. I must have completely missed the other Ostman die. Yeah, it's right there. It's it's mangled corpse on the ground. Uh, but yeah. Let's, let's just let's just observe a moment of silence for everything that's dying for our American player because it's everything and it's dying uh but yeah while we while we enjoy the carnage i'll just kind of go over the the build the philosophy of the build and what it hopes to accomplish what it manages to accomplish and what it can it can't really in my opinion there's not too much uh, improvement or refinement that can be done to a strategy such as this. It's a very robust and reflexive strategy and what I mean by reflexive is it has the ability to be modified and altered based on what you as the player uh, scout, what you sense, what you believe to be happening and that can be very difficult for the standard American style of play to cope with because generally speaking that's not what American players like to face. They'd much rather face, you know, you're gonna go grand spam, you're gonna go standard tier 1, tier 2, tier, 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 tier 3. And this is something that's a little different and a little easier to work with what the American player is doing. And it gives you defensive options because you have defensive doctrine, you have for the fatherland, you have a heavy tier 1. So you have a lot of defense against early game flanks. You also have a lot of defense against passive follow-ups, such as M8s, because you can punish your opponent in the interim period where he doesn't quite have M8s yet, but he doesn't 
quite want to be investing manpower into attacking because he's teching. You can push up, take a cutoff, force your opponent to react maybe a little bit earlier than he would like. And you also have the ability to be aggressive against sniper play, against super passive uh, weapon support center and howitzer based play, even uh, stalt, stalt a Sherman type strategies are very easily dealt with with a strategy such as this because you have offensive p uh, potential with that tier 4 and with that for the fatherland which allows you to push forward and deal damage and take territory when your opponent would much rather you sit back on the territory you have and wait for him to come to you uh, and that gives you a lot more flexibility as the Vermont player because you can do a lot more with a strategy that doesn't force you to be passive because you don't have the tools to be aggressive. Um, uh, aside from that, I don't believe I have anything else to say on the matter. It's a very interesting strat. It's, it's one that I have studied a lot and still do not play as well as Malium does. Malium's a very, very used to this style and very good at executing it. Uh, he is a big believer in using tier 4 against defensive play, and after watching him use tier 4 against defensive play, I'd have to say I'm a believer as well. Uh, I definitely do not use it nearly as well as he does, and every time I watch his games, I run a little bit more and pick out small little details, cool things he does, stuff like that. Uh, things that make it a lot more a lot more obvious why I want to be doing certain things and why I probably don't want to be doing certain other things, stuff like that. Uh, and I definitely think a lot of Venmox players are simply far too passive in the mid and mid to late game. They have the attitude that, hey, the, the American player is just going to come to me, you know, I'm the Venmox, I have the MGs, I'm supposed to be the one who's Offensive. I'm supposed to be the one who's sitting back. I can trust my American opponent to attack me. But more and more frequently, uh, it's become po not only popular but powerful to play a passive style of American play going into the late game. Because attacking into a well set up army of grenadiers, uh, pumas, packs, and the like is not really cost effective or economically intelligent. Uh, simply because you're giving your opponent a free advantage by allowing him to defend in superior cover with mines, wire, and attacking on your opponent's terms rather than your own terms. It's very powerful these days to play a passive style with howitzers and snipers until you get to off-map combat group and use that as your cost-effective anti-tank and and slight anti-infantry stuff like that and a strategy such as this is very good against that because it punishes delaying it punishes banking up manpower because you're constantly applying aggression and you're constantly investing in units for a solid 15 to 20 minutes into the game before you sharply transition into tier 4 and that's the main difference is you're investing one single block of money in your tech which is the tier 2 building and after that everything goes into units until tier 4 Whereas your opponent is going to be investing in a little bit of infantry tech maybe with grenades or bars, going to have to get a triage center, going to have to get his supply yard, going to have to maybe get a motor pool or get a tank depot. And by that point, your superior infantry force, because you've been building up units while he's been building up tech. So he has, he has more tech, but you have the units that can counter his tech provided you play well, and you have the, the supplemental boost of defensive and of for the fatherland to offset a bit of that tech cost in exchange in exchange for some munitions which is really the gist of the strategy and what it boils down to is using munitions in order to gain a manpower advantage and using that manpower advantage to be aggressive when your opponent doesn't want you to be aggressive so i hope that helped you guys out it's a very interesting strat i definitely encourage you guys to try it out see how you like it, see if it's something that you feel you could use, or if it's something you'd want to modify, or anything like that. A lot of the core concepts can, can be applied to a lot of different strategies on other maps. Obviously, the, the Angleville Cutoff 
strat that we focused on last episode is one that immediately comes to mind. Uh, but that's going to be it for episode number, number, what episode number is this? This is episode number four. Yeah, okay, it's four. My goodness. <laughs> it's late. It is 1.45 a.m. That's my excuse. Uh, that is it for episode four. I'll be back in the very near future. I'll be streaming a lot more. You can check that out on twitch.tv slash inverse TV, of course. Subscribe to me on YouTube if you like what I do. I'm very close to 2,000. Last I checked, I was 14 away. That's very exciting. I'll think of something special and magical to do uh, if and when I hit 2,000, so that'll be very fun. And also follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash inverse TV if that's your kind of thing. I post a lot of updates, post a lot of co-related stuff, especially with Company of Heroes 2 coming out. There's a lot of very exciting uh, information on the horizon regarding Company of Heroes 2 and new fan site information for Company of Heroes 2, all very exciting and should be uh, should have more information in the near future and I'll definitely be sure to keep you guys posted in that regard uh, that's about it, that's all the announcements all the shoutouts, all the pimping I got left in me right now, I'm going to go to bed I'll see you guys next time